Okay. Um, I'm, my name is Catherine Butler Jones, and I grew up in New York City. As a matter of fact, I grew up in Harlem in a an apartment building uh, where very important people like Walter White and W. E. B. Du Bois, Thurgood Marshall, were my neighbors, and so I grew up in an environment where there were some significant role models that I didn't know were role models, but certainly um, I knew that black people were uh, in positions to make change and that these people were doing very significant things. Um, I also grew up in the building with uh, Dr. Mei Chin, who was my physician and was the first uh, African-American woman to be appointed to the uh, faculty and practice at Bellevue Hospital. And again, it was someone that was just my doctor, but later on when I was doing some research, I found out more about her and the important role that she played in cancer research. So um, I was an only child. Uh, I grew up in, in this building and lived there until I got married. Um, I also went to the first black school, uh, private school in Harlem, called the Modern School, which was founded by Mildred Johnson, who was the niece of James Weldon Johnson and the daughter of J. Rosman Johnson, who were very important people in the musical world. And he was the, James Weldon Johnson was the president of the National Association of the NAACP for a number of years. Um, and her idea of having this school, and the reason that she started it was because uh, there weren't very many good schools in, in New York at that time. Public schools were not offering black students a very good education. And she modeled the school after the ethical schools and the Fieldston School from which she graduated. The ethical and, culture mm -hmm, schools? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And when I finished, I went What through, year would that have been when you uh, started? I went through the modern school up until the third grade, and then I also... What were you, do you mind telling us what year that was? <laughs> well, I started Generally. the modern school in 40. 1940, okay, uh -huh. so we're and talking I about... I went yeah. through there until, I guess, 40, 43, 44, and then I, my mother decided to <coughs> that she would have me tested, and I was tested, uh, to, took the exam for Hunter, Hunter High School, Hunter Model School, Horace Mann, Lincoln, the Elizabeth Irwin School, and the Ethical Culture Schools. And we decided to go to Ethical, and um, at the time of <laughs> the interview, my mother uh, informed the registrar that she was a graduate of Oxford University, she thought would be very helpful in their consideration of me as a <laughs> candidate for this school. And Did your mother go to Oxford and, University? You know, she made a very good story. <laughs> she impressed everybody, and everybody believed, and I believed, and all my friends believed. In me. <laughs> Until I found out that the um, when I was doing my doctoral dissertation um, and interviewed her as part of a course that I was taking. Um, I interviewed her, and I, she said she left Jamaica for the first time when she came to the United States in 1921. And I said, well, Mother, what about your, your studies at Oxford? She said, oh. <laughs> she said, I just told that story to, uh, so that you'd get into the school, and you did, didn't you? <laughs> so, she did a, a good job yeah, of was, uh, <laughs> convincing people. Right. So um, that was that was my experience of, of I had been only in private schools all of my life until I came to Boston and taught in the Boston public schools. That was my first experience in a public school, and that was a shock. But I'll mention that talk more about that in, later on. Um, the other thing that happened in this building in which I grew up. Um, which I kept the apartment from the time that my mother lived there. And my children have used the apartment when they've worked in New York City and when they've lived there and studied there. And so this has been a place that has been an important part of my life, a place where I found about 10 years ago a document that dramatically changed my life when I found the marriage certificate of my great-grandparents 
living in Troy, New York, and having been married in 1843 by Henry Highland Garnett, who became a very famous abolitionist. And that set me on a journey that brought me upstate New York, and to find out that my family had been a farming family in the 1820s, and before that had been um, property owners in 1790 in Albany, New York, and my great-great-grandmother was born in 1774 in Rensselaer County. So there was a whole history of uh, tremendous um, ancestors in New York State and the history of my belonging to New York State. Um, my father was born in Boston and the family moved to New York City in the late 1890s um, and so I've had an opportunity to explore my family history in that context. Um, interestingly, the Ethical Culture Society was founded uh, way back to help immigrants that came to this country to get established. And a number of people who were involved in the settlement movement in New York, the formation of the first settlement in New York, in the United States was University Settlement, which is located on Eldridge Street in Lower East Side. And Felix Adler was the founder of the Ethical Culture Society. And it is a humanistic religion that um, he was the son of a rabbi, the rabbi of Temple uh, Israel, Emmanuel. And he revolted from going into his father's, following his father's profession, and, and started the Ethical Culture Society in the 1870s. And the, what they did was to establish a school for working men's children. And uh, that was the forerunner of the Ethical Culture Schools. Um, it was for immigrant children. It had a, a, a hands-on curriculum which, that young people learn by doing. And that philosophy, which also was underlying, was modeled by James Dewey, John, John Dewey's philosophy of education, uh, became the foundation for the Ethical Culture um, Society and for the schools. One of the things that was important about the schools is that we did indeed do a lot of hands-on work and also working with our hands and crafts and so forth. And the curriculum was related so that everything that you did was connected to a core, a core course. Um, it was also attempting to do some experimental things in education. So that's, that's where I had my fourth, fifth, and sixth grade experience. And I uh, had an opportunity during that time also to attend the Ethical Culture School camp in Cooperstown, New York, where I met my husband, and uh, worked as a counselor there, and also was connected with the Ethical Culture school, uh, Society at Sunday School, where I went to Sunday School and graduated, and later became a member of the Ethical Culture Society. Um, when, and, and it was in that, in that context of, that I was married, that Phoebe and I were married the Ethical Culture Society by Henry Herman in 1957. So, um, the, also it represented a very liberal philosophy and we had Pete Seeger come and sing for us when we were in high school and um, I had the Weavers come to the University Settlement Camp where I worked as a work camp group one summer when they were blacklisted by FBI and the McCarthy era and could not do any recordings or make any mm. performances. And so they came and sang to us at, in these two different settings, which was really very exciting. So it is in this, it is in, within this context um, that my interest in peace and exploration of issues of civil rights and individual respect and for people of all groups emanated and was reinforced. Certainly came from my family, but the school situation continued to reinforce those kinds of beliefs and ideas. Um, and when we were in junior high school, in, this, in actually the fourth form in my sophomore year, we did a play called E equals MC Square, was, which was about nuclear weaponry and the atomic explosions, which became a very important part of my growing up years the end of the Second World War with the formation of the United Nations and our involvement in going to the United Nations for various uh, events uh, was, was important. And, and then, um, as I re 
call uh, in college. I also took courses in um, atomic energy and read the bulletin of the atomic scientists and uh, was concerned about what was going to happen because the world could have indeed come to an end very abruptly. Um, then later on, when um, I became a parent of young, uh, my first daughter was born in 1959, and I remember writing letters to to Senator, to the, at that time President Kennedy about nuclear disarmament, being concerned and involved with it at that point. And then I remember also of having a poster in my office. I I was an administrator in the Newton Public Schools about. Um, there should, if the next war, the next wars will be called, and nobody may show up. Um, that that banner. So those are some of the things that I remembered that were the background for me getting involved in some way with the peace movement. Mm -hmm. um, 409 Edgecombe Avenue uh, was built in 1917, and at that time Harlem was a white community. It was not until the late 1920s that African Americans did indeed come to Harlem and make it their home. Um, and this building didn't turn black until um, until the early 1930s, late 1920s, early 1930s. During the time of the Depression, they could not not fill the building, and so it was a big deal about um, this invasion of hordes that were coming into Harlem and the Harlem News had articles about how to make sure that blacks didn't move into these into these buildings at whatever cost. There were covenants that were established and so forth. And it's interesting also that later on in terms of my getting a house in Newton, I had to deal with the same kind of restrictions and not, people not willing to, to sell to African American families. Um, 409 Edgecombe Avenue was also the place where Harriet Belafonte hauled trash when he came to uh, the United <laughs> States from Jamaica. And I learned that just a, a few years ago when he was talking to him about writing my memoir. And he mentioned uh, having that experience. <laughs> uh, it was an elegant building, a 14-story uh, building with a penthouse with um, uh, elevator operators, two elevator operators, elevators at each wing of the building, and service elevator, and doormen, and announcers, and all of that. But it was also a building that I call a vertical community, because people of all ranks uh, lived in that building. So we had felt, we had people who worked as red caps. That meant that they carried uh, luggage at Grand Central Station. Uh, we had lawyers, one of the um, important first women lawyers, she was a graduate of, of Smith College by the name of Elsie uh, um, Carter, was a, a member um, part of this community. And um, so I came in contact with people. Of what did your dad do? My father was a post office employee, which was a very good job at that time. Um, he was born here in Boston in 1882. And my mother was from Jamaica, British West Indies at that time, and she came here on vacation to visit her family, her older sisters and brothers who were living here. She came for a vacation. She never considered herself an immigrant. She was just a visitor, and she never went back to Jamaica. Made a career as a self-employed hairdresser and uh, learned the Madame Walker's technique, and that was what she did for her livelihood. Um, the ethical culture, culture schools. The yeah. ethical culture schools mm -hmm. uh, located or, uh, what? on yes. uh, Madam Walker began a very important industry for uh, Negro women because uh, at that time in the 1920s when her technique was, when she developed her technique and was the most successful businesswoman, millionaire, um, Black women could only work as maids and um, in white people's homes. And this hairdressing technique made it possible for black women to be independent, economically independent, and uh, start businesses of their own. My mother worked in a, where she learned to do this process, was in a, a beauty shop, shop called Frankie's, which was located in 130 some street and 7th Avenue. 
and um, Frankie uh, tore her, did her hair, and she was very impressed with the way she looked, and she decided she wanted to take up the business. And this was the shop that did all the hair for the women that were worked in the show business and the Cotton Club and all of those places. So she had her introduction to American life in Harlem through through working in this in this beauty shop. Uh, what I also wanted to mention was the modern school and how important that was because of the fact that it was the first school that black children had as an in, run by black people in Harlem. And the school was only about a block and a half away from my house. So I walked to school uh, with my mother every day and uh, the school was modeled by, uh, by the ethical culture schools because Mildred Johnson was a graduate in the class of 1932 from the Fieldston School. And she started the school not because she really wanted to start a school, but because when she was taking a course to become a teacher um, in private schools, and this course was offered through the Ethical Culture Schools, they told her when she enrolled that she wouldn't be able to get a teaching position in a private school. So there was really no point in her pursuing that goal. But she decided that she, she was prepared to do it, she was going to. So you had to have a practice teaching assignment in a school. And she had two assignments um, at the ethical coaches schools. And then the third year, she was supposed to have an assignment. And no school would take her as a practice teacher. So she then decided she would go to her minister, who was uh, Reverend Shelton Bishop from St. Philip's Church, which was the largest Episcopal Church in New York, a uh, black Episcopal Church, and, and rent the vestry from him uh, to use to start a school. And that's, what, that's how the school started. So she had a few children each year until she went up to the sixth grade. And the modern school still exists in, in New York. It's celebrated, I guess, about 64 years of existence. Uh, so it's nice to have that con kind of continuity. Um, and I'm very fortunate to have the uh, places that, I, that were important to me uh, are still ongoing. The building I grew up in, the school I went to, uh, elementary, high school, college, and so forth. Um, so no lack of role models there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I should say not. Um, the other thing that um, I was going to say, I forgot. Um, ethical culture? Uh, yeah, we were going to talk about where that was located, right? And then, did I, I'm not sure whether I mentioned the fact that I had been to all of these places that were spin offs of the Ethical Society or not. Did I say no. That oh, I didn't say that on the, the tape? Okay. Um, the Ethical Culture schools uh, were predominantly Jewish. Um, there were, from the beginning of the school, Negro children that attended. And I have reviewed some of the class pictures in the archives, and um, there were black children in the school. And we're talking about small classes, and you might have two black students in a class of eight. So there was a representation. And the philosophy of the school was to take any children that appeared um, if they were qualified. And that seems to be reflected in what I saw when I reviewed uh, the yearbooks. Nevertheless, there, in my class, I was the only black in my class, um, there were perhaps two uh, blacks in, in each class. Um, and the issue of race was not considered to be an important issue, although it was an important issue, but it wasn't dealt with um, at all. Um, as an issue because everybody was supposed to be equal and the same. Um, but it was a cocoon for me. It was a very protective environment. Um, I had good friends. I was involved in, in um, forestry sports. I was uh, elected to the captain of the cheerleading squad, the captain of the tennis team. Um, I, I participated in, in activities that, that were uh, sponsored by the school. And in the high school, I attended the Friday evening clubs at the Ethical Culture Society, which was located at 2 West 64th Street. Um, teenage kids, uh, high school, square dancing, discussion groups, and all of that. So that was the environment that I lived in, as well as being a part of the Harlem community. 
and in my senior year, I wrote a column for the New York Age about the younger set, which was the title of that. And I wrote about all the wonderful things that black kids were doing, scholarships that they won, schools that they attended, uh, activities, community service, because we were trained to uh, succeed. We were trained as part of what you might call the talented temp of young people of uh, African heritage. We had the opportunity to learn and the opportunity to give back to the community. So that was always something that we were imbued with, the idea that um, we had something to give back and that we were supported by the community. But the vertical community of 409 in which people were always asking me, how is school? What are you planning to do? And the people who were my mother's customers, uh, people who came to their house to get their hair done, uh, had a very special relationship with my, with my family. And we were, and I was, uh, the kind of the person that a lot, of, a lot was expected of, of in that context. Um, uh, when, when I went to Fieldston, uh, again, the, the curriculum continued to be different from most public schools, I gather, as I found out later on when I taught in public schools. And uh, one of the illustrious graduates of the Fieldston School was J. Robert Oppenheim, who was involved in the creation of the, uh, splitting the atom. Um, and he had been a student at Fieldston had learned all that the physics teacher could teach him, and then went on to, I believe, to Columbia University. Uh, when he was still in high school, he was taking courses at, uh, at uh, college in order to round out, to go as far as he possibly could in terms of his scientific knowledge. Um, because of this connection with Fieldston, uh, I know that our class physics students went down to Princeton to the Institute of Advanced Study to meet with he and uh, Albert Einstein. <laughs> Einstein. Yeah. Um, and they had an opportunity to ask questions and have them answered and so forth. And so um, he was someone that I knew of through this connection with Fieldston. Um, and of course, he had gone through a great deal in terms of the McCarthy time when, uh, when he was considered to be a, a spy for Russia and went through all of that. So that was something that was part of my growing up experience. We also went to the United Nations and learned about that during the early stages of its involvement on, on, uh, in New York City. And uh, when I went on to college, I took courses at Mount Holyoke in atomic energy and which also was talking about the philosophy and around the issues of the, the scientists that were involved with the publication of the, of the atomic scientists um, around peace and what should be done with this to make sure that it didn't escalate into more destructive weaponry. Um, then uh, after I was married at the Ethical Culture Society and moved up here because my husband was working in Boston as a social worker, I started teaching in the Boston public schools and got an understanding, a better understanding of what the level of public education was at that time. And, um, and then also uh, took courses and did my master's in, in education at Simmons College um, during the time when the United States was trying to catch up with Russia after the Sputnik uh, um, episode um, and then put some money into doing some work to train teachers to work uh, in urban settings and also to do more work in science. So that's um, in the 1950s we're talking about at that point? I'm 19... talking about, no, I, I, I finished college in 1957. I was also, I went to Mount Holyoke, I was the only black a member of my class, and there were four black students, one in each class, and um, uh, so. But that was that was the setting in which I did my undergraduate work, and then I did my graduate work at Simmons College, and my doctorate at Harvard uh, in, in education and administrative policy. Um, but I remember very distinctly um, that when my first daughter was born, Karen, in 1959, 
and she became a toddler. That was the time that the whole issue about the Cuban Missile Crisis and the, uh, the danger of us getting into a, a, another war at this time of atomic weapon was. I remember writing to President Kennedy and asking him to use caution around that and to urge movement toward disarmament. Um, and I, so that was an activist, the beginning of some kind of activism around the issue of peace. Um, then. Uh, I know that when we had some difficulty buying a house in New, um, as a matter of fact, uh, the person whom we were planning to buy a house from was threatened by the neighbors and received very uh, calls telling him that his life was in danger and urged him to give back the deposit that we had made for the house. Now this was a house in what part of Newton and uh, what this year? This was on Talbot Street in West Newton. And uh, it was a nice little modified Cape house. And I was a, had been a school teacher in the Boston schools for a couple of years, a recent graduate of Mount Holyoke College. My husband was a social worker with a master's degree from Boston University. And we thought we were just going to come in and, and get a house and settle down uh, because we knew we wanted to get out of We had lived in Cambridge for a couple of years. And, we wanted to come to Newton because I knew that they had a good school system. And uh, it was the, my introduction to the fair housing movement, and because the fair housing movement was a person from Canada, uh, was helpful uh, to help us get, get this house. Um, but it was, as I said, soon after that that I became involved in the fair housing organization. Uh, became a member of the organization. And at that time, I would say that we knew all of the black families that lived in, in Newton. Um, there were just a handful. Of, most of the people had been here for generations um, who lived in West Newton or part of the Myrtle Baptist Church and that history, important history of Newton as the only black church in Newton. Um, uh, so at, at any rate, I became involved in fair housing, and through that, met a number of people who were also involved in the peace movement. And uh, my real involvement with the peace movement was my connection with it was through Shirley Sapin, who um, I learned a lot about group organization and, and sending out mailings and coll collating materials and so forth. And there was also uh, through that organization, I became introduced to the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, to the Voice of Women, and met uh, women from Russia who came to visit the United States for conferences. And even though uh, the peace movement was one part of my life, and I had this poster up in my office at uh, Newton Public Schools about uh, a war that perhaps nobody would come to. Um, my major effort was in the area of civil rights and uh, educational issues and the METCO program which brought children from Boston to suburban communities. So that was really my, was my real focus, but obviously the peace movement and the con continuation of life on this planet was of, of importance as well. Yeah, because that's important. That's important. Uh, because of my involvement in teaching in the Boston Public Schools, uh, I started as a substitute teacher and ended up teaching in East Boston, probably the only black person that was teaching in East Boston in the 1950s before the whole issue of de facto segregation in the Boston schools became a fact. Um, when we uh, left Cambridge, we left Cambridge with one daughter and uh, one on the way, and when I bought, when we bought a home in Newton, we had two children. Um, and, uh, we did have eight children. We still have eight <laughs> children and uh, three grandchildren at this point. Um, married children, um, two other daughters who were married. Um, our children were educated in the Newton schools, and I remember in the nineteen late 1950s when the 
schools were closed down in Prince Edward County, Virginia, because they didn't want to desegregate. And Newton had three students from Prince Edward County attending schools in Newton. Superintendent of schools at that time was Charles Brown. And he was uh, very, very supportive of this idea. And I thought that it would be a good idea for children from Boston to come to school in Newton because I knew that this education they were receiving in the, in the uh, schools in Boston was not satisfactory. I also, by this time, I believe, had a daughter in the Newton public schools, and I knew that the, the schools needed change here. Um, the fact that I had had a good education and we had libraries and all of that were part of elementary school. I was shocked when they were just beginning to think about doing things like that in Newton. Um, because of my commitment to education, and I guess particularly about having my kids have a good education and feeling that it was a right that people had to have a good education, um, I had proposed to uh, Chuck Brown uh, the idea of bringing children from Boston to school in Newton. And at that time, there was no legislation that made it legal for another school system to educate children from another community. And so it was subsequently that the racial imbalance law was passed in order to make that possible. But um, at the time that I had the interview with Chuck Brown, I remember that he asked me if I didn't want to take a job with the Newton Public Schools. But I was, at that time, it was a time when women did not go to work. They stayed home with the children. And children were in school for, in Newton, for uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. They got out at, at um, noon time, and school dismissed the other three days at 2.30. So it was pretty difficult to have any kind of outside employment. Um, so what I did uh, was to drag my children to all of these meetings. When Medco started and I was, uh, I called Ruth Batson and, and said to Ruth, um, these people are thinking about bringing children to, to, to suburban school systems, but we really need to make sure that those school systems are ready to receive these children. And so it was important from my perspective to make sure that schools not only increase the number of African American teachers, so that they were role models for children, of adults, professional people, uh, but also that the curriculum needed to be re-examined to make sure that it represented African American history, and that the books that were just at that time the beginning of integrated textbooks, and I felt that that was a very important part of the curriculum, and that the teachers needed to be trained to have some understanding of what the experience would be like for children coming from the city to suburban schools. Um, I was one of the very few people who had had experience in uh, predominantly white settings. And I was asked then to do the guidelines for the Medco program, which was used in all of the participating school systems. Um, and as I, I should mention, that when the Medco program was started in 1966, there were only seven communities involved and uh, only 220 children started in 1966. The program now in 2001 has um, 40 communities involved and about 4,000 children that are going to schools. And the program obviously has graduated a number of students over the years. Um, Newton had the largest and continues to have the largest program. And we now have children who graduated from Newton schools and their children are now graduating from the Newton Medco School. So this is a wonderful continuity. Unfortunately, the Boston schools have not improved and their waiting list for this program, which we thought would be a passing fancy, but it has been a permanent institution in, in Massachusetts and a model for other communities throughout the country. Um, Now, in, in order to do the kinds of things that I wanted to do, I had to drag my kids with me to a lot of meetings. And one of the things that was an outgrowth of the work that was going on in terms of Boston and the uh, Boston community being concerned about schools was the form formulation of freedom schools. And I was involved in starting a freedom school in Newton that was in co collaboration with the Roxbury Neighborhood House. 
and we use the Elliott Congregational Church here in Newton um, and the Roxbury Neighborhood House for alternate meetings. Um, and we had a very full program, about 200 kids uh, every month, this Freedom School met. And, um, and that was something that we set up a nursery school in the basement of the church so that the people who were teaching and planning could bring their children and, and leave them there and then do the work with the, with the students. And we'd go into Boston and uh, visit important institutions. Um, and we were in Senator Brooks' office, who was eventually the first black senator since Reconstruction, when the lights went out on the East Coast. And we scrambled out of there with candlelight into streets with mm -hmm. no street lights and to get back to the Elliott Church. But um, and this was a rich enrichment program, really. This uh, was a, it wasn't a um, regular school. It no, was no, a, this was just the program. Since the schools were not integrated and the schools were not um, doing much with curriculum, there were a number of parents that felt that this was an important part of their children's education, and it was the forerunner of Metco. It actually started a couple of years before Metco. Um, to provide this education for kids, and we did it after school. So after they were in school. another school, and this was that's right, supplementing, that's right. bringing kids from new schools and from different Boston public schools through the Roxbury uh, neighborhood house to come out, and then we go in and be hosted by them. So that I always felt that it was really important for children to feel that they it, there was a reciprocal relationship that it wasn't one sided, and I brought that into the thinking about METCO to make sure that the parents who signed up to be involved with METCO as host parents were willing to have their children to go into Boston, to Roxbury, to Mattapan, and spend time with the children, with their host families in that community, and work with the parents and teachers, and bring them into Roxbury for meetings at Freedom House and all of that, so that, so that, that children had a sense that they had something to offer, that their culture was important, and that people could learn from, from that as well. So it was it was significant that we did not we're not involved in in so called work, but I did indeed. Well, I had I guess Lisa was my fifth child, and uh, she was born in March. I was involved with Metco as the, the coordinator of the Metco program, and um, then when she was born in that May, I got my master's degree from Simmons College. So I was going to you know I was going to school. I was uh, had these children, and my husband would stay home uh, to take care of the children when I went to to, uh, to classes, and I did my masters over a couple of years. But at any rate, I had always felt that since my mother had modeled that as being a mother as well as a, a wage earner, I was I felt that one could manage to have children and have a career and pursue education and also do um, the community service work, the things that were really important to change in the society. So that was, that's always been my, uh, the, it's always been what has, has uh, kept me going. And I'm very happy that, um, that we have eight children, that they have had a strong commitment to social service, that they've been involved in education. Um, I have a daughter who works now for the Center for Collaborative Education with the Boston schools and improving teacher um, teacher training so that they can do a more effective job. Um, I have a daughter who is a corporate lawyer in the law firm in, 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 um, in Boston. Uh, I have a son who was involved in political activity in the Democratic Party and worked for Freedom House, doing important programs for that organization. Um, I have a son who was uh, involved with the Antique Roadshow and working in film and a um, daughter who has done a lot of work in documentary film, uh, who has uh, done stuff on African American history that's been shown on Black Sides and shown on Channel 2 in Boston, public television all over the country. And um, a daughter who is just is working in Ghana now um, in, in for the Population Council. My, I also have another daughter, my oldest, who is uh, was working in the field of art and uh, as a curator and a daughter who works for the uh, Washington Public Schools and is a, has a doctorate in, in psychology. 
So uh, our kids have uh, done a lot of interesting things, and um, I'm very proud of the commitment to community that they've all demonstrated in their activities besides their work um, and the kind of work that they're doing to make social change in this, in this country. I've been very lucky during the time that, um, that I pursued my doctoral studies. I was elected to the school committee and served on the Newton Public School Committee for eight years. Um, and was working full time at that time with uh, Cambridge Public Schools as the supervisor of elementary staff and program. And the only way that I was able to manage juggling all of those different hats at the same time was that I had a wonderful person who worked with our family for 18 years, Mrs. Richards, who was my housekeeper. And I re learned that from Margaret Mead when I went to a meeting many, many years ago. And she said, if you're going to do something, you have to make sure that somebody else can go into your refrigerator and prepare meals and take care of the household responsibilities to free you to be able to do some of those things. And um, I'm, I'm very proud of my children, my husband, the work that, that we've all done as a family uh, to try to make this world a better place to live in. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, in 1978, I decided to run for the school committee because there was a very conservative bent in the Newton uh, school committee. Um, and I ran on a slate um, with the concern candidates against the voice candidates who were considered to be conservative and were making all kinds of inroads in the school system to prevent programs that brought black children together um, and voted against them and were continually asking questions about METCO and asking for justification of the program and asking me to make reports. and. I said, well, I cannot continue to run this program uh, because there were severe cuts uh, in staff. I had developed a staff of 10 people uh, that were people who were social workers, uh, counselors, uh, curriculum development. We had other kinds of programs that brought kids together from, from various places in a neutral side of science program. And, um, and that, was, that was the way that I saw that this program could could support the children that were here, meet, work with the parents, and make the program work effectively so that 86% of the children who were graduating from Newton schools were going on to college. I served as a director of the Metco program in Newton for 10 years. I was on the board of the Metco program uh, for about seven years as a founder of the program. Um, and so when I left Newton, I decided to resign because I couldn't run the program effectively. And I decided I would run to, for school committee and that way enable me to make policy that would affect the schools directly and support the program from that standpoint. Um, obviously, I was an educator. I had, um, had taught in schools and was the curriculum and, and um, elementary staff supervisor for the Cambridge schools. When, when I ran for the, uh, for the position of the school committee. Nevertheless, uh, because I was African American, it was assumed that I, and the Metco director, that I would be bringing children. I heard rumors that I'd be bringing children, all the black children from Boston would be coming to school in Newton, and that was the, that was a, I was a one issue candidate. I knew nothing else but Metco. My, Metco was my forte. Uh, I ran, a, my husband ran a very successful campaign. I've had about 200 coffees uh, going to people's homes and talking about what I could bring to the school system. And I, I won election by a very narrow margin. Um, the other members of the concern slate won uh, very clear victories. Uh, my, mine was a, a very narrow victory. Um, I did indeed uh, run against three white males and so from that perspective, I, I think I did well. Um, I, had, I ran against the same candidate the second time that I ran for election. Uh, but I was successful and had four uh, terms as a member of the Newton School Committee, the maximum number you could have uh, consecutive terms. And I did make a very important contribution, I think, in terms of the whole issue of declining enrollment of closing schools, of bringing computer, um, 
uh, education into the uh, into the Newton Public Schools, protecting the Medco program, getting the school system to adopt a policy of having 10% of the population of faculty and administration be people of African American background, and indeed making significant changes in the curriculum over over the period of time. Um, so, it, but it was important for, uh, it was the first and only African American that has been elected to the Newton school system in the history of the schools, which is unfortunate. Um, and, but I, I did also receive a very nice honor when I left, and there was a retirement party for me uh, with over 200 people attended. And, um, and it was at that right retirement party that I announced that I was considering being a candidate for the school committee. One of the other very wonderful things that I felt very proud about was that I was given by the Black Citizens of Newton a scholarship that was named for me as Catherine, uh, well, was the Catherine Jones um, Scholarship for a graduating Medco student uh, for, for one year. Um, so at any rate, I I think I you know I was able to do some things that made made a lasting difference in terms of education. My whole career has been a, about education. I was elected also to by the uh, alumni of Mount Holyoke College to, as a member of the board of trustees, and I served on that board of trustees for five years. And again, began to get the school to look at the curriculum to um, uh, support the issues of social responsibility around the investment of the, co of the college in, uh, in get, getting them beginning to think about getting out of, out of investments in South Africa. And um, so those are some of the other, other issues aspects. you're interested yeah. in. Where were you living in Newton just um, when you ran for school committee and what war, was it a uh, ward? ward two. Okay, and it was ward two you represented? Mm -hmm. No, but it's city -wide. It was a city-wide. Oh yeah, the thing. school committee is city-wide. Oh, I thought that was one. And, uh, no, you run okay. from the ward, uh -huh. but you're elected city-wide, so everybody can. So vote you for had to you. Yeah. campaign all over the city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We uh, need, yeah, we do need.